So for years, people have tried to attain shaping through shaking. Check this out. So that's uh, in the 1800s. That's the Walton vibrating machine. They thought that that would shake you into shape. Oh, and then in the 1900s, they invented the human hamster wheel. You can't make this stuff up. Now, I love this picture because you got the whole family at the gym. You know, you got the, the daughters over there doing some pull-ups. Uh, you got the son on the row machine. The, the little boy he looks like he's about to do some, some cleaning jerks or something. I don't know. But you got mom on the human hamster wheel getting ready to shake with a dress on, by the way. It's weird. I think that one through. And then the 1920s, I don't know if you know this, but the mechanical bowl was actually invented as an exercise machine. You know that? How cool would that be to have one of those bad boys at EOS, you know what I'm saying? Like at the gym? I'm waiting in line for the bowl. So, <laughs> so then, then you get the, the, uh, the gyro wheel. Put the gyro. So that would shake you 360 degrees, full shimmy and a full shake, and you're going to shake yourself right into shape. We laugh because they were crazy, right? But yet... We're still just as crazy because if you go online today, you will find the vibration platform. For $125, you can take that home from Walmart. Spend just five minutes a day shaking yourself into shape. Or go on Amazon and buy the electrical stim machine and put it right on the source. Just <laughs> go right to the source on that one. 65 bucks and you can have that. Here's the point. In the natural world, Shaping through shaking, it doesn't work. But in the spiritual world, it's completely different. In fact, in the spiritual realm, shaping through shaking is actually God's preferred means of helping us shed that dead spiritual weight. Help, uh, helping us transform into the people that God has called us to be. We don't like it, but that's the method he uses. It requires some shaking. Here's the title of the message. Shaping through shaking. The, the, you're going to experience, and you already have, but it's coming, more is coming, agitation. You're going to experience some tremors. You're going to experience some convulsions in life through the path of obedience. Every time something shakes in your life, does it mean that you're doing something wrong? In fact, oftentimes you're right smack dab in the will of God, doing exactly what you're supposed to do, and God wants to use that shaking to shape you and I. Haggai chapter two, we're gonna get into God's word today. You ready for the word of God today? Come on. Haggai chapter two, we're going to the Old Testament today, and we're going to see some, some shaping through shaking. Now, let me give you some history. So in 586 BC, the Babylonians came in and wiped out the Israelites, and they took them off into Babylonian exile to Babylon, which would be modern day Iraq. They destroyed Solomon's temple. It was a beautiful temple. They destroyed that. They wiped that out. But then years later, the Babylonians would be conquered by the Persians. And the, when the Persians conquered the Babylonians, they let the Israelites go back to Jerusalem and they would rebuild the temple. Now, it, the year was 538 BC and a guy who was charged with building, rebuilding the temple was the governor of Judah and his name was Zerubbabel. Say that with me, Zerubbabel, Zerubbabel. Don't name your kid Zerubbabel unless he's a bad kid, in which case that's fair game. It's rubble. So what basically what happened is rubble, he got the people together, he united them, and they poured the foundation. It took him two years to pour the foundation for the new temple. Everything was great. The foundation was poured. They're ready to build upon that foundation. And then some shaking occurred. It says in Haggai chapter 1, verse 2, that... Uh, the people said, it's not time right now to rebuild. You know, there's always an excuse, right? And so God allowed some, some shaking. Sometimes it's God-induced shaking. Sometimes it's people-induced shaking. But either way, God allowed it. And so the, the shaking caused the work to stop. The work on the temple from 5 
536, remember we're counting down to the birth of Jesus, 536 down to 520, for 16 years, the work ceased, which brings up a point. Sometimes the shaking can shape you, but if you're not careful, sometimes that shaping, it can, it can break you. And the choice is really up to, to you and I. So God sends the prophet Haggai to wake him up and to say, look, it's time to get back to work. God's got a plan, and, he's got, and the plan involves some shaking. So Haggai chapter 2, verse 1. On the 21st day of the seventh month, the word of the Lord came through the prophet Haggai. Speak to Zerubbabel, son of Shealtiel, governor of Judah, uh, to Joshua, son of Josedach, the high priest, and to the remnant of the people. Ask them... Who of you is left who saw the house in its former glory? How does it look to you now? Does it not seem to you like nothing? Hmm. But now be strong, Zerubbabel, declares the Lord. Be strong, Joshua, son of Josedek, the high priest. Be strong, all you people of the United States of America and Christians around the world, declares the Lord. And work, for I am with you, declares the Lord Almighty. This is what I covenanted with you when you came out of Egypt. And my spirit remains among you. Do not fear. This is what the Lord Almighty says. In a little while, I will once more shake the heavens and the earth, the sea and the dry land. I will shake all nations. What is desired by all nations will come. And I will fill this house with glory, says the Lord Almighty. The silver is mine. The gold is mine. The unborn children in the womb are mine. The definition of man and woman, that's mine too, declares the Lord Almighty. The glory of this present house will be greater than the glory of the former house, says the Lord Almighty. And in this place, I will grant peace, declares the Lord Almighty. Thank you, God, for your promise that stands true today. God, that we can, we can stand in a place of, of, of certainty in the midst of an uncertain world, God. You are firm. You are sure. And God, we thank you for the shaking that we see. We thank you for the, the shaking behind the scenes that we cannot see or know. We know that you are involved in all of it and you are in control and you are shaping us through the shaking. We thank you for that. Help us understand that truth today. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen, amen. So shaking is brought to you in part by God, sometimes by man, but either way he allows it to help shape our perspective. Shaking shapes our perspective. Check out verse three again. I, I love what God, how God speaks to the, to the people. He says, um, so who of you remember Solomon's temple? Uh, doesn't this new temple, doesn't it seem like nothing to you? Hmm. You know, I don't know if you know about Solomon's temple. Go ahead and put a picture. We have a picture of it. This is the scale of it compared to like a football field. It was a big temple. I mean, it, it, it had fine, precious metals. It was massive in size. I mean, it, was, it, was, it had the Ark of the Covenant in there, which represented the presence of God. I mean, when they dedicated the temple, do you remember? Heaven uh, sent down fire, and the fire lit up the altar. I mean, it was a big deal. This was a, a beautiful temple. And Zerubbabel's temple was smaller in size. Now, we don't know the exact dimensions. Some of the dimensions are listed, but not all of them are listed. But we know that from Ezra's account, we can go back to Ezra. Ezra was a priest who was exiled and then brought back. And so his account provides us a little more information on what was going on. Check this out. Ezra chapter 3, verse 10. When the builders laid the foundation of the temple of the Lord, the priests in their vestments and with their trumpets and the Levites, the sons of Asaph, with symbols took their places to praise the Lord as prescribed by David, king of Israel. With praise and thanksgiving, they sang to the Lord. They had a worship service just like we, we're having. He is good and his love toward Israel endures forever and all the people gave a great shout of praise to the Lord because the foundation of the house of the Lord was laid. Woohoo! We got to keep reading. Verse 12, but. But always sets in contrast. You know something's about to shift. But many of the older priests and Levites and the family heads who had seen the former temple wept 
aloud when they saw the foundation of the temple being laid, while many others shouted for joy. No one could distinguish the sound of the saints, uh, the, of the shouts of joy from the sound of weeping, because the people made such a noise, and, and the sound was heard far away. Did you catch that? We got a good old-fashioned dichotomy. You got the, the young people. They poured the foundation. They saw what God was doing. And they said, man, this is something. But then you got the older people who remembered and saw the, 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 the grandeur of, of the old temple. And they saw that this was smaller. And they wept aloud and they said, this is nothing. This is something. This is nothing. That's a dichotomy. Two, both, both people love Jesus. Both groups of people love God. They just saw things. They had a different perspective. I love what Theodore Roosevelt said. He said, comparison is the thief of joy. You want to lack joy in your life? Just pull out your phone real quick, go on social media, and find someone who's got such a better life than you. Because I'm sure everything they're presenting online is exactly how it is at home. <laughs> See, God, he can do a lot with nothing. Amen. Oh, man. If you read this book, in fact, the more you read this book, you'll realize that God loves to do uh, work through people who are a little rough around the edges. <laughs> Guy named David. So Samuel the prophet goes to Jesse and says, um, I'm supposed to anoint one of your kids, uh, you know, for, to be the next king. Jesse's like, all right, Eliab, his firstborn son. Eliab comes out, he's all tall, tall dark, and handsome. And, and, and Samuel's like, surely this is the one. And God's like, oh, no, no, no. See, you're looking for something. I'm looking at what no one else can see. Something that the world would say is, Nothing. I, I look at the heart. And to, to the world, that means nothing. They, they're all on the external, right? And, and so they go one after the other one. Don't you have another son? Well, I got one other one. Uh, it's David, I mean, but he's, he's, a, he's watching the herd. I mean, he's, he's, a, he's out in the field. Well, go, go get him. And this guy who the world would think was nothing comes in and, and, and Samuel says, that's the one. That's the one. I, I, I'm going to do something. Something there. See, but, but then you fast forward to the next chapter. That was, that was 1 Samuel 16. Go to 1 Samuel 17. The, the guy who was nothing, David, he was still, he was anointed as king, but he was still waiting, and the world still looked at him as nothing, so much so that they, they left him home when the other went to battle. And, and, and he goes to provision his brothers who are fighting the battle, fighting the Philistines. He goes to give them a little snack, right? And, and he's like, whoa, it's the Valley of Elah. And he sees this big 10-foot giant out there taunting the Israelites. And he's like, Y'all gonna y'all okay with this? And, and they're like, no, but he's kind of big and we're kind of scared. And he's like, the guy who was nothing said, oh, I'll, I'll take him on. They're like, no, 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 you're nothing. They're like, yeah, no, no, I, 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 I saw God do this in the field with the, with the bear and the lion. I, I said, okay, well, all right, well, listen, listen we know he's nothing, so we got to try to make him something. See, the world always tries to, to qualify Nothing with something by something that they hold value. Remember what they did? What they do? They got Saul's armor. Because Saul's armor was something. It represented victory. And Saul had probably killed a lot of people in that army. And so if we can take something that's nothing and put something on him, maybe he'll be something in our eyes. And so they try to put the armor on and he's like, no, it doesn't fit. It's too big. I got to do it old school. I got to do it the way God told me. I got to do it with nothing. Well, what do you mean? Ah, uh, man, yeah, I, I got to take a... Uh, uh, five stones and a sling. So you're going to go out to fight the giant with nothing? Yeah, that's, that's how I roll. And so he goes out, <laughs> knocks the giant down. What does he kill the giant with? See, you all were in first service. <laughs> Most people say the stone. But yes, you're right. He actually killed him. If you read the text, 1 Samuel 17, he killed him with Goliath's sword. Something that he didn't even have when he marched into battle. You could say he marched into battle with nothing. You could say nothing walked into battle with nothing. But here's what I want to tell you. Your nothing is something to God. 
Someone needs to hear that today. You came into church and you feel like, I got nothing, I got nothing to offer. Oh, God's about to do something from your nothing. Write that in the chat. Write that in the chat. Your nothing is something. Your small act of kindness to your spouse actually means a lot more than you think. That, that, little, that, little, that little nothing time in the morning, that little 10 minutes that you give God, you know, the five minutes of reading and five minutes of prayer, that means way more than you think to God and to your life. That little nothing of obedience when you just invited a coworker to, uh, I met someone in the lobby, they invited them to church. They, this girl's been looking for a church for months and she's like, I found my home. Why? Because he invited her, a coworker, to church. That, that, that little 10%, you remember the Bible talks about giving a 10% tithe? That little 10%, that, that's nothing. <laughs> Try that for a month and see what God does in your life. Trust him and you see what God does from nothing. Your nothing is something. And, and friends, I just got to tell you, God is laying a foundation here. I don't know if you know this, but God is doing something special. We're in our summer slump and we're almost out of room. You know, it, God is bringing people out of the woodwork because God is laying a new foundation. He's doing something very big in our city and he's gonna use this gathering, this church to be a big part of it. But we have to decide which group of people we're gonna be because there, in the text, there was two groups of people, both loved Jesus. One were worshipers, one were whiners. Which one are we gonna be? I hope so because you know, there's people in this church who don't like the smoke. Now, here's the thing. We didn't used to have smoke. Well, yeah, but God's laying a new foundation. Yeah. And, and, and let me, let's, let's be biblical. <laughs> there was always smoke in the temple. Read Leviticus 6, verse 3. They kept the fire burning 24 hours a day, seven days a week, according to Levitical law. They kept it burning so they could always be ready to offer a sacrifice. There was always smoke in the temple. And, and here's the thing about the smoke. I could take it or leave it. I could care less if we have it or we, we don't. That doesn't matter to me. But if it helps young people, and for some reason it does, I don't know, ask them. But <laughs> I'm not quite in that category anymore. But if it helps them, so long as Christ is crucified, is preached from this pulpit, and he's the only rock star, who cares about smoke? I could care less. And, and, let me, and while I'm at it, let me just step in a little bit more. I know we got some great people here who, who struggle with certain words and songs, like, for instance, the reckless love song. We get people who say, look, God's love isn't reckless. Tell that to Mary. When, when, she, when she watched her son crawl up on a cross and die for a, a crime he never committed for people, that were sinners like you and me? That seems kind of reckless. If my kid did that, I, think, I would think that was right. Here's the thing. Our language, we cannot, the, the finite cannot accurately comprehend or describe or articulate the infinite. We cannot do it. We do not have words. You know what we got for the word love in, in, in English? We got one word, love. It means one thing. It's a one size fits all. I love Twinkies or I love my wife. <laughs> at least in the Greek language, <laughs> at least in the Greek language, they got four, agape, phileo, uh, eros, and, and stergo. They got four, four different words for love, but even that pales in comparison. Even that's not enough to describe the love of God that pursues us on our worst day. I love... Uh, and if you want to study more about this, get The Weight of Glory. It's a, it's a book called The Weight of Glory uh, by C.S. Lewis. And in The Weight of Glory, he actually talks about this. He calls it the doctrine of transposition for all you big scholars. And basically what it is, he says, if you are to translate from a language which has a large vocabulary, that would be a heavenly language, into a language that has a small vocabulary, English, then you must be allowed to use several words in more than one sense. So while I would maybe not describe God's love as reckless, I could see why someone would. <laughs> maybe God's trying to shape your perspective today. We're not going to vary from the truth. 
we're not going to change this. We're, we're standing true on this. But the way that's articulated to a world that is ever changing, we could be cognizant of that. We could be aware of that so that we don't walk out of a church because of a word or because of some smoke rising, <laughs> right? God is shaping us. He's shaping our perspective, but he does it through the shaking. Second point, shaking shapes your purpose. It shapes your purpose. I, I love this. If you go back to verse four, he's like, be strong, Zerubbabel. You know, he says, uh, be strong, be strong, be strong, be strong. I have covenant with you. My spirit remains among you. What is he saying? He's saying, don't lose your purpose. Don't lose your purpose. <laughs> we live in a world that's not focused on purpose. You know what this world is focused on? Your persona, your image, my image, how we project to people. Do me a favor, wake him up, would you? I'm just messing with you. No, but seriously, wake him up. No. We're worried about an image, right? Like, we, if you don't believe that we're worried about an image, just go, come to, come to my gym with me. I mean, it's, it's really funny. I mean, I guess it's funny because we're, for us older people, it's, it's funny because we, if, we, if, if, if my dad ever caught me, you know, in front of the mirror it's with cameras set up and, I mean, I'm like, and I'm just standing there like watching. I'm like, surely he's going to see me and like, feel, no, no, they just keep on rolling. And so I talked to some of these guys and they said like, yeah, yo, you know, I'm a, I'm a, uh, I'm a social media influencer. <laughs> They're influencers. Well, I thought to myself, that's, that's true. First Peter 4.10. God has given each of you a gift from his great variety of spiritual gifts. Use them to serve or influence one another. So I guess we are influencers, but how you steward that influence, you can have live a life of purpose or you can live a life of vanity. Here's, here's what I'm saying. The point of influence is not affluence. It's not to enrich yourself. It's not to see how many followers you can get. It's to see how many followers we can bring to the cross. That said, that said, we should take care of ourselves and God can use your physicality and he does. And the proof is this guy over here, Julian. Julian, you know how many people come to this church who are athletes and they come because they respect him, right? And so God, God will use all of that, but just make sure we use it in a way that brings people to Jesus, not to ourself, amen? amen. So God wants to shape your purpose, but I think sometimes in the process of, of him trying to shape our purpose, if, it's, it's hard to even say because it breaks my heart, but, but a lot of times our purpose gets shattered. And in the midst of the shaping that he wants to do, something went wrong, something happened. Um, my, my wife showed me this picture, go ahead and put that up. Something in life, uh, every, you know, sometimes in life, everything goes smoothly, and then sometimes the unexpected happens, break, right? The purpose is, is shattered. The important thing is knowing how to turn problems into opportunities. That's wonderful. That's great. It ends all nice and sweet, like a beautiful song. It resolves. Everything's perfect. Well, I think a lot of times it's unresolved. I think a lot of times we stay in that broken stage, not because the cross wasn't enough, but because we don't believe we're enough. We don't believe he would really die for me and that I can really become what he's called me to be. That was for somebody else. And what happens is we, <clears throat> we suffer a disfigured purpose. And I have to ask you, do you have a disfigured purpose? And the reality is, a lot of us, if we were honest, we would raise our hand and say, you know what, I think I have a disfigured purpose. And I wanna show you how this happens because it doesn't happen overnight. You didn't get that way overnight. We didn't get that way overnight. Um, let me, Quavion. Come on up here, buddy. I need, you. I need some help. So I want to show you from God's word really how this, this, this uh, process of disfiguration happens to your purpose. Because the enemy would, the enemy wants to tell you everything's. <laughs> Did he do it? 
<laughs> Pride cometh before a fall. <laughs> okay, be careful. Some of you who aren't here last week or the few, there's this thing that everyone likes to, they like to make fun of me because I can't j- make that jump. I have to walk, I have to do like the old man stair walk, you know what I'm saying? The young people just jump. Jordan tried it one time and he split his pants, but that was a whole nother. Is he in here? Okay. He's probably getting them sewn up as we speak. So, so here's, here, here's, here's how this, this process, and, and it's cool because I know, I know you've been through some stuff too. Like I know we've had coffee. I know your story and, and, and you know, this, you could probably relate to this, but, uh, so here's how Ezra chapter four, verse, verse four, then the people of the land discouraged the people of Judah, those people who were building the temple and made them afraid to build. So oftentimes it's people that can, that the enemy can use to disfigure our purpose and bribed counselors against them to frustrate their purpose. And that just jumped out at me when I was studying God's word because I think a lot of us, Quavam, we suffer from a frustrated purpose. I'm just gonna let that sink in for a second. A lot of us, we are carrying around a frustrated purpose. And a frustrated purpose leads to frustrated people. You ever met a Christian who's super frustrated? If you haven't, go to Target. <laughs> they seem to hang out there. So this, is, this book is, is called The Bait of Satan. And it really just talks about how the bait of Satan, he'll use um, frustration. He'll get us inwardly fighting and, 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 and arguing and, and fussing over silly stuff. Well, we bought, I think, 15 copies of this to sell out there. We sold out already, so um, sorry about that. Next time, me of little faith. Um, but, but if you want to go out there, they can tell you where to order this book. But listen, this is a great resource. Trust me on this. It's, I, you know, I, I only recommend a book if it's, if it's good, and this one is very good. Uh, but so the, 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 the starts off... The stages of, of, of purpose disfiguration is frustrated. So you're frustrated. You begin to doubt your call. You begin to doubt your gift. And you begin to like, is God really going to use me? And that translates into stage two, which is a fragmented purpose, where you kind of just like, you know what? I've been burnt by church so much. I've been hurt by funky church people that I'm just going to like, maybe I said funky. <laughs> Relax. I'm going to dip my toe in. Um, are those, uh, they're Crocs. oh, they're Crocs. Okay. I, th- I thought you had some Hey Dudes on. <laughs> no. All right. What do you mean? No, I, I got Hey Dudes. I'm sorry. <laughs> no, not Hey Dudes. I guess those are old man's shoes. <laughs> That's all right. So I put my little hey dude in the water, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> and that's, you, you, you become fragmented. You just give God a little bit, but not too much because you don't want to get hurt. And then stage three, you go from frustrated, fragmented to it's just a facade. Your purpose becomes a total facade. You distance yourself from people. You distance yourself from the call of God. You don't really even want to go to church because there's some guy up on the stage or other pastors on the stage that, are, that actually love you and care for your well-being. And sometimes the conviction of the Holy Spirit works through a person, right? And so you, like, you, just, you just settle for so much less than what you've been called to do. And you want to know, I want to, give you a, I want to give you an image of what a disfigured purpose looks like so you don't forget what this looks like. Come on, where, where, where are you at? What kind of operation are you running, Shane? <laughs> All right. All right. So just look at me, okay? This is, this is how he's supposed to look right here. Are you going to switch to it? Are you going to switch to it? No? Shepherd of lost sheep, come in, lost sheep. <laughs> Don't got it? Uh-uh. Oh, 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 oh. Oh, you are so lucky if this doesn't work. Are we dead? We got a five-second window. Five, four. We done? All right. Well, anyways, you're lucky. Here's what I was going to do. And it actually... Huh? Bring a camera. Oh, go get yeah, bring a camera. Bring a uh, 
Oh, and just look at this, you mean? Yeah. Come on, Chris. Come on up here. Come on, Chris. Come on, jump, 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 jump. Oh, yes. With the camera in hand. All right, come on up. Yeah, you, you got to get this. You're basically taking a picture of this. So, all right. So you got, you got. <laughs> so here's, here's how your purpose is supposed to look. <laughs> oh, man. That is, that is the, that made you like five inches. <laughs> you remember Fat Albert? Remember this? Thing? <laughs> oh, that's awesome. Hang on. Hang on. That's hilarious. Are you getting this? Yeah. <laughs> uh, sorry. <laughs> That's a squash. Yeah, look at that. Uh, That's grumpy. That's grumpy. That's butt. Uh, That's hammerhead. Light bulb. <laughs> Blockhead. <laughs> and radioactive. That is one large beak. All right. <laughs> Give him a hand, everyone. Good job. Good job, man. Oh, that's funny. But it's only funny when we look at that, but it's not funny when that's your life. That's not funny when that's your purpose, when we live with disfigured purpose. Check this out. In the text, Zerubbabel and those people lived 16 years with a disfigured purpose, and somehow they talked them in so they, they talk themselves into, oh, it's okay. Must be God's will. We're just waiting on God. Be careful of what you can talk yourself into. I'm just waiting on the Lord. No, you're not. He's waiting on you. Now, there are times when we must wait on the Lord, and, and, and that's the biblical thing to do. But don't you dare f- frame your apathy or my apathy as, oh, must not be God's timing. Man, don't settle for that. That's crap. I said crap. And if you're more mad that I said crap and less mad that you're actually settling for it, we've got a problem. Perhaps God sent me to to do some shaking today, to do some agitation, to wake us up and say, how long, oh people of God, will we settle for a disfigured purpose? You are called to more. You are greater than that. Don't you settle. Christians around the world, they were settling. We ain't the first Christians to ever settle. We have a history of settling for so much less. Don't be one of them. Don't be one of them. God has called you. Say, but Pastor John, you don't understand. You don't know the people that I, that, that I have in my circle. You don't, you don't know the, 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 the circumstances that I, that I deal with. Oh, oh, oh. Check this out. God brings you people and circumstances to reveal where you are not free. I got that from my friend Brian Bowers. God, God that, that's how God uses the shaking. He uses people. He uses circumstances that we cannot control to agitate us, to shape us, to make him more like him and to remind us of our purpose for which we have been called. Shaking shapes our purpose. Shapes our perspective. Shapes our purpose. And lastly, shaking shapes our path. There's a path that God has us on and oftentimes he has to shake us to get us back on that path, to shape our path. The glory of this present house will be greater than the glory of the former house. Do you believe that? I think a lot of us read that, but we don't believe it. We believe our best days have already transpired. We live our life instead of looking forward and looking at the foundation. We have... We have become adept at looking in the rear view mirror. And the last time I checked, when you try to move forward and you're looking in the rear view mirror, accidents happen. The word God gave me in 20 of 21, December of 2021, right before the new year, was greater. I shared that word with the church. We were over at Valley Vista where we used to meet. Well, a few weeks later, Aaron calls me up. And uh, she says, um, got some bad news. Uh, the Vista, we're, not gonna, we're gonna have to move from the Vista to Shadow Ridge. Now, I don't know if you know the history of Shadow Ridge, but to my knowledge, all the churches that have 
planted here and existed here are no more. There was a, a, a joke, which is not a joke, but a sad reality is that people say that this is where churches come to die. So moving to uh, Shadow Ridge was probably not on the top of my list, but then God reminded me of what he spoke to me. He spoke to me greater. Don't doubt in the dark what God has shown you in the light. <laughs> so the last message I preached, God reminded me, and, and the last message I preached at Vista was January 9th of this year, 2022. And I preached this 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 passage, not the whole passage, but this verse. I read the verse, the glory of this present house will be greater than the, 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 the glory of the former house. And I said, I believe that is prophetic for what God's going to do. Now, I know there's people in here who thought that, oh, he's a salesman. He's just got to say that to minimize the collateral damage. Thank you for your faith and your support. <laughs> uh, listen, I meant that with all my heart. Now, I didn't know how that was gonna look because I'm like, we're going from 1,400 seats to 500 seats. So I don't know how you're gonna fulfill that, but you spoke that to me, God, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna speak it to the people. I'm gonna throw it out there because I believe, I don't know how you're gonna do it, but, but I believe you spoke that to me. And so I preached that. And don't you know that uh, over the six months we've been here, we have grown by 300 people. <laughs> Over a thousand worshipers come into this building. Isn't that crazy? And we're running out of space, by the way. But God's got another plan for that. Oh, that's cool. He's early. But that's okay. Uh, I'll, you can play through the whole thing. Um, but what shakes your path, it shapes your path. You understand that? What shakes your path and you think is, oh, it's, it's going to knock me off course. And the guy said, no, 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 we're redirecting. I'm getting you back on course. I'm shaping your path through the process of shaking. He can use your age. He can use a health situation. He can use a divorce. God didn't cause the divorce, but he can use it. He can use family drama. He can even use loss to shape our path. I'm gonna ask my, my dear friend, Jen, to come up. So Cindy and I, we met, Jen, you wanna come up? No? Come on up, come on up, Cindy. So Cindy and I, we met, um, we met Jen in August of 2015. I was at a former church here in town and I preached a message. And after the message, I gave some time uh, you know, to respond and maybe for prayer. And that's where we first met Jen at the altar. And I'll never forget the first encounter because Jen was literally shaking letting out these, 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 these uh, gasps and just bent over the altar, just, just literally shaking. Uh, it's, just a, it's, a, it's a picture I, I, I'll never forget. And I would l soon learn that you, uh, just a few weeks earlier, Jen lost her 17-year-old daughter, Celeste, in a tragic car accident while coming home from school. She was broken, to say the least and shaking and I prayed for her we prayed for her that day and you know sometimes you don't remember what you say but I remembered a lot of this one because it was just so unique and so special and so heavy what you were carrying and I, I prayed that God would use this tragedy to shape your life and for it to be used to shape other people's lives. I remember praying that prayer. Well, fast forward years later, she ends up at the gathering and 
And uh, I'm, I'm, I'm thankful God brought you here, girl. Um, but she says, you know, she, she said she wanted to help. She said, I'm ready to help um, speak into our, our students, into our young adults. And so she sent me a, a message. And I was reading that message this week because I was thinking of the shaking you endured to, and, and that God brought you through to get you to the place where you could use that tragedy as a, as a testimony. And I know this is it's going to be hard for her even to read this, but she sent me that message. And I thought, my God, you have used the shaking of her life to shape her in a way that is undeniable and unforgettable and that will help others deal with the shaking that God's taken you through. So I've, I'm asking her to read the very message that she sent me a few months ago. There are plenty of days that keeping up with all the demands of motherhood and wifehood have left me exhausted in every way. But I have come to realize now more than ever, slowly but surely, that God is not finished with me yet. Amen. He has been and he continues to be so faithful in guiding me through countless challenges and trials since becoming a mama 24 years ago. From facing great disappointment, abuse of every kind, rejection, addiction, hopelessness, and isolation. Not to mention the unimaginable heartbreak when my daughter, Celeste, left this earth and how it could have easily destroyed me is what brought me to truly understand my mission as a mama, Jesus' sacrifice, and God's promise of hope to heaven. Yet each of these moments that I may have even wished away. I now understand in a new way that each one has mattered to God. Amen. He is so good. And I know I could not and I would not be here if it weren't for him. Some days I have to remind myself of this more than others, but I am so honored that he would trust me to be a part in raising up our next generation. I do not take this lightly. There is no greater gift than to see the cultivated love and patience that is given day after day, along with the occasional tears, blood, and sweat be transformed into something so beautifully intangible as the fruits of our labor are seen through our children. Yeah. I see you. Yeah. As they grow up and they grow out, it's nothing short of beautiful. Only God. I am absolutely blessed, my friends. Can we give God praise? Did you catch that? She said, a mom with a mission. The shaking that she endured, although she can never get Celeste back, she can be a spiritual and is a spiritual mother to people in this church. In fact, on Wednesday night, she was a spiritual mother. She was a spiritual mother to my daughters, Riley and Stella, because they meet with uh, Mary. Mary's here too. And, they, and if you want to know, learn more about that and get your young people involved with that, they, they meet on Wednesday nights and they're just speaking into that generation. She's a spiritual mother. She's a mom with a mission. She didn't let it derail her. <laughs> so as we wrap this up, and thank you for, for being willing to go there. I know that's hard. 
But I also know you got a, a daughter in heaven who's very proud of her mom with a mission. But Haggai's prophecy of greater would be fulfilled 500 years after he spoke it. See, sometimes it takes some time. Sometimes there's latency. Sometimes there's, there's a faith gap that happens. And so what do you do in the faith gap? You be obedient. You trust what God spoke to you. But 500 years later, that would be fulfilled so in 20 BC, King Herod, he would take Zerubbabel's temple and he would renovate it. He would expand it and check out how big the Herod's temple, which was started as Zerubbabel's temple. Look at how massive that is in comparison to Solomon's temple. Remember, Solomon's temple was big. And the people at that time thought, oh, it'll never be like that. Well, 500 years later, they ended up with King Herod's temple, all started by Zerubbabel. But let me be careful because we're talking about greater. We're talking about the shaking that God does to, to, to make us greater. Be careful not to measure greater as grandeur. Greater is not a measure of grandeur. It's not a measure of, of, of size. The fulfillment of the prophecy was not realized in the presence of the magnitude of the temple, but rather the fulfillment of that prophecy was realized in the presence of the Messiah. Jesus himself, 500 years later, would walk in that temple, would witness in that temple, would be a part of life transformation in that temple that Zerubbabel built. Friends, greater for us is realized in the same way. <laughs> greater for us is realized by presence, by the presence of God, a greater presence of God in our life, a greater presence of God in our home, a greater presence of, of, of God in our city, and a greater presence of God in these United States and beyond. Greater <laughs> awaits us, but there's a path to get there. And that path will intersect a massive amount of shaking, of turbulence, of tremors. But those things will shape you and I into the people God has called us to be. I pray this week when you feel the shaking, some of you already feel it, you're already in a season of shaking. For those that you are, you're there. But for those that aren't, you'll get there. When you feel the shaking this week, you have a choice. You can be a worshiper or you can be a whiner. You can lift your head to the heavens or you can sulk. I pray that we would nudge our eyes heavenward and we'd smile in the midst of all the shaking, realizing that God is doing something great. He is doing something great in our lives that we will use to help shape not only our family, but shape people all over the world that are watching online and that are here today. God is at work shaping through shaking. Lord, I thank you for every person. I thank you for every struggle. I thank you for everything that people are carrying. I just pray that, God, that we would sense your presence, that we would know that you are real, and that we, we, would, we would know that you have a plan. You are reigniting our purpose. You're realigning us with that purpose, God. You are not finished with us yet. God, help us endure the shaking that is inevitable and that is totally necessary to become what you've called us to become and to accomplish the very work you've called us to accomplish. God, we in a sense, are building a temple as well. We don't know where that temple may be for the gathering, but you do. <laughs> you know the size, you know the dimensions, you know all the details. We just thank you, God, that that temple would be built, but God, moreover, we are the temple. We carry that temple with us wherever we go. Help us be the light to a dark world. With every head bowed and every eye closed, if you don't know Jesus and you wanna know him, 
You can know him by, by praying this simple prayer. <clears throat> Say, Jesus, I need you in my life. Forgive me for my mistakes and thank you for using me to do something great in this life. I love you and from this moment on, you are my king. In Jesus' name, let's celebrate new life. Come on, welcome to the family of God. Yeah. And I just found out too, by the way, uh, we, had a, we had an atheist uh, who came to service one. I don't know if she accepted Christ or not. I don't know, but I know that she was here. And I think, man, what a great place. What a great foundation God is laying when he's bringing hurt and broken people who need Jesus. Amen? Amen, 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 amen. If you made that decision to accept Christ, we have a free gift for you. Stop at our Connect counter. If you want information about that book, you can also stop out there. They'll give you the information uh, for that book as well. If you need prayer, we've got our prayer team, our pastors, our elders up here. We would love to pray for you. We're in this thing together, and we do life better together. Amen? For the rest of us, let's leave this place with a smile on our face, getting ready to walk into a world that's shaken, knowing that God is doing some shaping through all that shaking. Amen? Amen. Amen. God bless you. We'll see you next week.